Hello everyone, very very good afternoon to all the viewers of The Legal Game. This is Kushagra Goel, your educator for the CLAT examination. So today, on December 21, we are going to discuss the newspaper analysis on two very pertinent issues. The one of them is the Aadhaar linking with electoral bonds. And the next big news is in relation to the parliament itself. So, before we divulge all the other details, let's dive straight into the newspaper analysis and see for ourselves what is there to be seen. So, the first big news for us is that Lok Sabha passes bill to link electoral rolls with Aadhaar. This is a reform that the government has brought in on the second last day of the parliament. What are the stated objectives for the same? The stated objective are multifold. The government believes that a lot of voter fraud happens in terms of elections. A lot of bogus votes are given by people who are not actually authentic voters and someone votes on their behalf. So linking of Aadhaar is going to reform this aspect. The other reform by the government is that it is going to make the process of updating the details on voter IDs very, very convenient. So voter ID or EPIC, Electoral Photo Identity Card, which is issued by the Election Commission of India. So remember, Election Commission of India is a constitutional body. The UIDAI or the Aadhaar Authority, okay? is a statutory or a legislative body. What is UDI? A statutory slash a legislative body. Okay. Now, details will be shared by a constitutional body with a statutory body. What will it do? It will make EPIC cards, the one that is given to every citizen of India above the age of 18 years. 18 saal ki upar hote hi, we all get the right to vote in India, which is a right exclusively for citizens of India. Now, all of us who have an Aadhaar card, okay, so, Aadhaar is a card that is given to residents of India. That means residents include citizens plus non-citizens also. So, one of the concern of the opposition is that this can lead to non-citizens being able to get the electoral cards or being able to get the right to vote. This is one of the big concerns. Now, first of all, what has been approved? Okay, so the linking is not mandatory. It is not mandatory for you to link your Aadhaar card with your voter ID card. Why is this done? Ek baat toh humne kar li to eliminate bogus voting. The second one, as the government has stated, is to boost voting. Boost voting in India. Or boost voting percentage. Aisa kyun hai? Iska relation hai India ke voter participation se. In relation to voter participation in India. A lot of people in India are migrant workers who migrate from every six months and whenever their uh, election is due in their area, they may not be able to go. For example, so many people during the lockdown had migrated back to their home states, but they were not original inhabitants. The moment lockdown happened and they saw that there is no work in this area anymore, they wanted to go back. Now, in regards to this, this is one big problem that has been highlighted. That people 
who are migrant workers. Okay, they face a problem to update their voter ID cards, to update the address and participate in voter list of a particular area, you need to fill up a form. Now, to get those details in, you need an identity. So if you have an Aadhaar card, then it can make it easy because updating the address in Aadhaar is much more easier or as it is presumed. Okay. It is a self-declaration. In Aadhaar, it is a self-declaration, whereas in a voter ID, it's a government check procedure that you have to verify that if this is happening or not. Jaise ki passport mein hota hai. So now migrant worker, if A or B person has a voter ID card, he or she can then go to the center of Aadhaar, get it updated and use the same Aadhaar card to obtain an EPIC card and participate in the elections. <coughs> this process has also been made easier. Pehle kya hota tha? Anyone who became a voter by January 1. So January 1 was the lock-in date every year. People who used to become 18 by January 2, hai? they had to wait, jaise ki, if the lock-in date is 2022, you become an adult on 2020. To ka second January. This person has to wait for the next deadline of 2023. Jab 2023 ke honge, tab he can vote. Or in elections of 2023, not in elections of 2022. Anyone who had become a vo eligible voter by January 1 of that year, only they were eligible to vote. Now, the date has been amended to provide January 1, April 1, July 1 and October 1. So now with a gap of 3-3 three, three months, there will be a lock-in period. This will allow people who have different assembly elections at different point of time to participate in those elections. This is the reform that the government has brought in. However, this bill was only circulated one day ago and was brought in and passed in two hours time. Okay. So the government, the opposition had slammed that there is a tearing hurry. If this is a big reform, what is the hurry to bring it right now? Okay. Now, <clears throat> every time there is some hush hush about laws, it creates a problem. But for us, that is not the case. We don't have to worry about political analysis. For us, only facts matter. So what is the fact for us? The fact for us is that the government has allowed the EPIC cards or the electoral rolls to be created through Aadhaar as an identity. It is not mandatory. It is optional. The other new thing that has happened is the Delimitation Commission. The Delimitation Commission was a body created under the head of Justice Ranjana Desai. She is the head of the panel for the delimitation of Jammu and Kashmir. This delimitation process was believed to be the one for the precursor to assembly elections in the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. As per the 2019 amendment, the assembly is supposed to now have a total of 90 seats. Okay. However, the delimitation process in the 90 member assembly okay, will be represented in two regions that is Jammu and Kashmir. Now Kashmir region has a population of 69 lakh, okay, approximate 69 lakh whereas the Jammu region has a population of if we round it off by 54 lakh. So, in this constituency, now the total vote share, okay, that each MLA will represent in this assembly for the Kashmir region, okay. So, Kashmir will now have 47 seats. The ratio then becomes 
for every one MLA, there will be 1.46 thousand voters. Okay, whereas for every MLA in Jammu region, okay, so Jammu till now had 50, 37, it will now have six more seats for Jammu, okay, so 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, okay, so a gap of only four and the ratio is 1.24 thousand votes, okay, this is in lakhs. These figures are in lakhs. Okay. So, every 1.24 lakh voters in Jammu will get one MLA. Whereas, for every 1.46 lakh voters in Kashmir region will get one MLA. Ideally, if this was the ratio that the commission was looking for, then the total MLAs from Kashmir region should have been 54 instead of 47 or it should have balanced out the ratio of the same for the Jammu region also maintaining what has happened now a voter in Jammu has much more power than a voter in Kashmir okay this is what the panel of MPs from national conference have criticized that now you have artificially given more power to a voter of Jammu region instead of the Kashmir Valley even though there is a majority of Kashmir MLAs the power of voter of Kashmir has now diminished this is very similar to the situation in southern regions in comparison to states in north for example southern states have much lower population but have larger representation because over the past 75 years, their population have declined. Whereas, the population in Uttar Pradesh or Bihar has increased. So, a voter is much more powerful in South than in the North. We, when we got independence, okay, we had set out for a rule of <coughs> for every one MP, there should be 10 lakh people. This was the ratio. This would have meant a voter anywhere is equal to one vote. But because of the population discrepancy, we have now broken this equilibrium. We have moved away from it. Okay. The delimitation commission was supposed to redraw the boundary. It is an exercise that should ideally happen before every elections. But because of the administrative difficulty in doing so, we don't do it. Okay. We have frozen delimitation in union parliament and every state assembly till 2026. But we allowed it for Jammu and Kashmir. This delimitation of Indian state assemblies and parliament will happen on 2021 census. Okay. This will happen on the 2021 census, whereas delimitation of Jammu and Kashmir has happened on the 2011 census. Matlab, jab naya data available ho sakta hai next year, usually census ke results ek saal ke andar aate hai. Census is happening over 2022 and 2023 because of COVID-19. Is saal process start late hui hai, so 2022 mein census hoga. 2023-24 तक results आएंगे उसके. So this was one of the contention of the opposition when the prime minister met the opposition leaders that if the country is going through a delimitation eventually in 2026 on basis of an updated population तो Jammu and Kashmir को वो deny क्यों किया जाए? जब उनकी process अभी हो रही है तो वो भी updated numbers पे होनी चाहिए? Okay. So this is the controversy related to what has happened in there. The voter percentage and the power of vote in each region is getting imbalanced. Alright. Now, before I move on further, I want to inform all of you that tomorrow 
I will be hosting a very special class on Hong Kong elections, which have happened over the past one week. We will be discussing the system of Hong Kong, what was the history of Hong Kong, how it all came about, what led to the change of scenario in Hong Kong. All of this in a special class at 9 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, you can find this class on the Learners app of Unacademy. And to access this class for totally free of cost, you can use my code KUSHGK. Through this link, you will be able to access this class for totally free of cost. Don't miss out on this session. It is very, very important for all of you. Okay, it will be a key marker to prepare for the scenario in Hong Kong. It is a very important current affairs issue. And while we are at this, Okay, now let's come back to the newspaper for us. So with this on the front page, these are the two important news. Now coming back to scenario in the national news. Now in the national news, the Delhi High Court heard a very peculiar petition yesterday. This was a petition filed by an ancestor of the great grandson of Bahadur Shah Zafar's wife. Bahadur Shah Zafar was the Mughal Emperor till 1857. In 1857, he was exiled. Then his great grandson, okay, the wife of his great grandson has now filed a petition in the Delhi High Court for receiving the red fort back. By the time the British exiled Bahadur Shah Zafar, the influence of Bahadur Shah Zafar was only limited to the red fort. Nothing else was in his possession. So, and the great grandson had died way back in 1980. Okay. What was the name of the guy? Muhammad Bedar. Mirza Muhammad Bedar Bhakt. He was the declared grandson of Bahadur Shah Zafar. He was receiving a pension. And this lady, who is the wife, had been receiving a government pension for the past, since 2010, her pension was 6,000 rupees per month. She now filed the case in the Delhi High Court that this property was illegally taken by the British and since then, the government of India had been in possession of it. Now, the government, the, the Delhi High Court stated, on grounds of inordinate delay or expiry of limitation period. That usually you have two years as a limitation time. Okay? And or whenever you should file the case whenever you are aware of it. This lady has been receiving the pension since 1980s almost 40 years have passed and her family has been deprived of the property for almost 150 years for 150 years none of their family members had filed any petition to claim this property now that they had not filed on grounds of inordinate delay to approach the court the petition was denied ये नहीं कहा कोर्ट ने कि ये प्रॉपर्टी आपकी नहीं है या आपकी हो नहीं सकती थी कोर्ट ने ये कहा कि इतने सालों से आपने इसके ऊपर कुछ नहीं कहा तो अब आप इसको क्लेम नहीं कर सकते भारत सरकार इसके राइटफुल पोजीशन में एंड विल कंटिन्यू टू रिमेन इन द पोजीशन ऑफ द प्रॉपर्टी एज पर द कोर्ट नाउ दिस लेडी हैज द फ्रीडम टू गो एंड फाइल अ पिटीशन in the Supreme Court in appeal of dismissal of this case, she had been living in Havra. She is a widow who is illiterate without any uh, offsprings. So there is no possess successor anymore. So this petition has now been denied on the grounds of limitation period expiry or expiration of the limitation period. So very peculiar case. of the limitation period. 
Then we move on in terms of other national news. Nothing of note for us primarily. Okay. Then there is news here of anti-conversion bill by Karnataka. In terms of religious freedom, every adult person in India has a right to choose his or her partner, whosoever they want to, and they have their individual choice to convert to A or B or C religion or be, become an agnostic and not follow any religion anymore. In terms of this, but different states over time have banned forceful conversions or illegal use of force to convert someone on false grounds or using coercion or fraud. That is a similar case that the Karnataka cabinet is also now bringing. To deal in relation to this, there is a landmark Supreme Court case of Shafin Jahan versus Union of India. This case is a key to identify the rights of adults adults to choose their partner or convert to a religion of their choice. This is the freedom that they have. The Supreme Court confirmed this right in the famous case of Shafin Jahan versus Union of India, where even parents or related family members cannot dictate to anyone to consenting adults that their choice, if or whatever it may be, even if not aligned to them, is permissible okay this bill will provide for punishment for forceful conversion with up to 10 years of imprisonment and a fine up to 10 lakh rupees this is in regard the karnataka government believes that a lot of people have been given bribe to convert from hinduism to christianity or a lot of illegal marriages have been taking place this will make marriages by force or fraud as null and void all right so we will be discussing this case of shafin jahan versus union of india as part of a special class on december 22 so please make sure that you attend it okay then we move on to the editorial section the main editorial here on the right hand side amid vaccine booster talk context matters a loss lot <clears throat> what is a booster dose there is two kinds of immunity that the vaccines generate in our body okay one is the antibodies okay these are direct soldiers you can identify them as first line of defense then there is a t cell the t cell is like the memory okay it is that if let's say we have soldiers who can deal with a land invasion now these soldiers die away but we have generals who now can train other people who can also fight the war so t cells are those generals in our body they remember the kind of threat so man lo your body has almost zero antibodies now by the time you get COVID, you have zero antibodies. But your body has T-cell immunity in the sense that it remembers what COVID-19 is all about and then can create more antibodies to fight off the virus. Booster doses help in creation of antibodies again in the body. It will actively once again pull up the antibodies which will remove the chance of a severe infection of COVID-19. So this is what has been confirmed that a lot of vaccines in the world 
have a 33% efficacy in general against the Omicron variant. Why? Because one, the time period of a booster dose is usually six months after the second dose. So by the time these six months die away, your body may have limited immunity or antibodies, but it does still possess the T cells to fight off the virus. This is the key aspect that we need to remember. Okay. So what the editors here are writing, Chandrakant Laharia and Gagandeep Kang, that one, we need to remember this is a fact. The second thing we also need to remember is we need to create localized data of immunity against Omicron variant. The studies till now that have happened are all based on mRNA vaccines. But in India, the vaccines that we have given are primarily the Covishield vaccine, which is an adenovirus vaccine. So we have not tested the efficacy of our vaccines against the Omicron variant. Our health minister, Mansuk Mandavia, has confirmed to the house that within a week or two, we will have localized report of how effective our vaccines are against the Omicron variant. And based on that, we will identify if we need booster doses for vulnerable population. Okay. So what all do we need to remember? We need to remember the two line of defense against the COVID-19 virus. We need to remember the mechanism of this. Okay. And then we need to remember also the what the government plans to do. One caution that this editorial brings about is that a lot of conversation during the second wave and first wave in India was not based on expert advice and we had suffered a lot. What we need to do is quick response based on scientific evidence regarding booster doses. All right. What is more important for us is the strategic bulwark. India will be hosting India hosted its third India Central Asia dialogue by external affairs minister and the members who attended this dialogue will all be coming back within a month's time to meet us and be our guest for the Republic Day ceremony. This is a grand event on which they are being invited. It will be India's 75th year as independence. We will be using 2022 is the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. Okay, so in that regard, the importance being given to Central Asia is clear. Central Asia is one region that can directly influence the conversation around Afghanistan. India has a lot of investment in Afghanistan. So we cannot lose the strategic heft we have created for ourselves there. That's first thing. The second is it also we have been actively engaging with the Central Asian countries in terms of advisor Ajit Doval's regional security dialogue okay, and other investment opportunities. So this one talks about that see in comparison to China our trade with these Central Asian countries is just 2 billion. China's trade with these countries is 100 billion US dollars. Okay, so we have a lot of catching up. China is the other most important country in this region. Okay, and through its BRI has been making a 100 billion trade investment in general. What are the alternate routes that we had come up with? There are two of them. We had thought of Iran's Shah Bahar port as a way to bypass and then the international north-south corridor and the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan gas pipeline. Okay. Regarding Instec, we had a question in CLAT examination. 
ओके इंस्टेक इज अ कॉरिडोर बिगिनिंग फ्रॉम चाबहार एंड देन गोइंग टू ईरान टू अफगानिस्तान एंड देन टू द सेंट्रल एशियन कंट्रीज ओके सो इट इज अ लिंक वाया सी एंड देन वाया लैंड टू बाईपास पाकिस्तान एंड कनेक्ट टू सेंट्रल एशियन कंट्रीज वी आर रिलायंस ऑन पाकिस्तान टू कनेक्ट विद सेंट्रल एशिया हैज बीन वन ऑफ द बिग प्रॉब्लम द अदर थिंग दैट दिस एडिटोरियल हाईलाइट इज द रीजन वाई वी आर लूजिंग आर हेफ्ट इन द रीजन विच इज ever since united states walked out of the jcpoa or unilateral withdrawal from the nuclear deal with iran sanctions have been imposed back on iran which have affected the overall scenario because of these sanctions we cannot continue to be engaged with iran for trade which has given the strategic space back to the chinese this is one problem the second aspect for us in this region is the main one which is a instable afghanistan an instable afghanistan will increase proliferation of drugs will create a refugee and humanitarian conflict and will then lead to spillover of violence and terrorism these three core interests drugs refugees and terrorism these are the three points on which we need to engage and continue our engagement with the countries of central asia all right so this is the key aspect that has been highlighted and why india has chosen to invite the five central asian republics to the republic day parade as chief guests highlighting the plight of women in afghanistan is this article for afghan women it's the great regression similar to the great depression of the 1930s this is the one about the overall regression for the afghan women for past 20 years they were in a democratic setup being allowed to work study go to college work in traditionally male dominated jobs but now they are being denied education their their schools are being shut college education colleges are being shut they are not allowed to even study modern subjects are being limited plus they colleges for men and women are being separated and third and the most important thing is women are being denied employment so she is highlighting the problem that taliban is creating that on the face of it to the world it believes that taliban has reformed a lot and it is now trying to become more inclusive have more women all of that is there but the reality is completely different all right so this editorial is important to understand what is the concern of india in afghanistan okay india and no country in the world has till now recognized afghanistan's taliban regime india has been calling for a all inclusive and reformed government in afghanistan for any recognition to happen so this is the key to be understood then on the left hand side the quartet of hope this is the quartet of ba male badminton players of india the recent performance of indian badminton players at the world badminton championship has raised hopes once again so despite pv sindhu being the only star player for the past 4 years that is the cycle between 2016 to 2021 that is the olympic cycle now finally we have these three men players also who have suddenly sprung into highlight lakshya sen lost out to k shrikant in the semi final and they are both at a very different stage of their career shrina shrikant should enter the prime of his career with 28 as his age while lakshya sen is a 
youngster at 20 years of age. So this is the different spectrum. While PV Sindhu has been the highlight and Saina Nepal has now at the fag end of her career with her prime way past her now and fitness issues catching up. So the quadrant of hope is the hope of future of Indian badminton that is being highlighted. K. Srinath became the first men's player to achieve a silver medal and Lakshya Sen a bronze medal. This is the first time India received two medals in the men category. Till now, Saina Nehwal and PV Sindhu had achieved medals at World Championship in badminton. Now, we have these two men also. So, this is the quadrant of hope. Quadrant means four. Okay. Then we move on. The sustained attack on federalism. What is this sustained attack on federalism? And what is federalism in general? Federalism in general is the arrangement of states' relationship with the Indian Union. In India is a holding together, fed, is a coming together federation. What does it mean? In India, we have a unitary bias. Okay, that is the government or its powers are tilted more towards the central government, which is visible in terms of the total taxpayer money on 40% of it goes to the states, while the 60% of it is retained with the union. Okay, so you can claim there is a 40 is to 60 ratio in favor of the union government. Similarly, the overall burden of the COVID-19 pandemic fell on the state governments. During the second wave, they were the one who were in the front line. For any lapse, it was called health is a state subject. However, over time, the funding for centrally sponsored schemes, the percentage of the revenue that states need to put in is increasing. Whereas, the amount of taxes they can generate for themselves is reducing. How is it reducing? First, the GST. The GST has put all the percentage of tax that was determined by states independently to the GST council. GST council is where the union government decides along with finance ministers of the state. Now, if the ruling party is one, majority of the state chief ministers go along with the ruling party. What this does is, states basically in the GST council work more like on party lines, just like Rajya Sabha, then how they should be, which is to represent the interest of states vis-a-vis -vis the central government. So there is a unitary bias there also that is being highlighted. Okay. So this article in general is a criticism of how we are now shifting slowly, slowly towards a unitary bias which is a sustained attack on federalism that states and their independence to determine the way they function is reducing which is a dangerous slippery slope then on the right hand side what rising inequality means this is in light of the world inequality report the world inequality report called out the Middle East and North Africa region is the most unequal with Europe with the least unequal. But India was identified as one of the most unequal countries of the world with top 10% of the population having income of 76% of the population. Top 10% owns 76% of the wealth and income in India. So there is a widening gap in general okay now the key is this editorial highlights two things one the failure of redistribution of wealth what is redistribution redistribution is collection and then giving something like robin hood we have been unable to distribute it like the robin hood why because of inefficiency of 
tax rate whereas so we have less amount of progressive taxation that is higher burden of tax is less on the rich and more on the poor so that means the tax rate is inefficient the second problem that is highlighted is rich nations and poor governments that over time governments are becoming poorer because they own less assets they have less things to control within them but the people there are becoming much more powerful okay so for example in us the rich class who finances the political parties can lobby the things they want to get done whereas people for example may have been demanding a raise in the minimum wage rate but that is not happening because they are less powerful than the rich or it would mean more income to the poor and less for the rich so therefore those things take time to happen for example we are moving towards a more privatized system a privatized system provides more benefit to the management of those who govern them instead of the people or it is more targeted towards private profits instead of public benefit so this is the world inequality report we i have conducted a entire session on world inequality report you can check it out on the link of it is in my telegram channel okay then we move on on the other national news so on the left hand side is the news that i have discussed on the front page already okay then who will be the next ambassador of india to china the next ambassador will be pradeep kumar rawat pradeep kumar rawat has been a career diplomat in the sense that he is a ifs officer has risen to the rank right now he was the ambassador to the netherlands he will now be moving to china so he is a mandarin speaker that is he can speak the chinese he has been involved in different crisis management with the chinese also so that's a key important why is this the need because this is a key time of tensions between india and china and the ambassador is the person who eventually decides the way the government policy will be one of the big problems leading up to the 1962 war was that for prime minister nehru who was our first prime minister in 1950 sardar patel passes away and in this decade of between the time of the conflict leading up to the conflict the council to the prime minister existed only via his ambassador one thing also need to be noted down is that jawaharlal nehru or prime minister nehru was also his own external affairs minister so he needed he had to rely much more on the ambassador to china than anyone else similarly in today's time we now have border tensions and in the age the ambassador is the only real person on ground in china in beijing where the capital is so if you want to look for signals of the government how to actually get anything done or any conversation to be done you need your ambassador to help you prime minister nehru did not have then in 1978 atal bihari vajpayee when he became the external affairs minister he traveled back to china and normalized the relationship since then now we are facing a similar conflict the tensions are as low as they were in the decades after the 1962 war so this is why the appointment of the new ambassador is a key figure for us then we move on punjab seeks not for tough laws on sacrilege punjab government had amended the ipc and crpc in 2018 but the president has not yet approved these amendments the governor or the president in terms of laws that applies in india and in a within a state and if something has to be distinct or a punishment has to be different the president needs to approve the same that approval has not yet happened in the past 3 years ab sacrilege hota kya hai sacrilege is 
और वॉट इज नोन इन गुरमुखी एज बेअत बी इज एनी एक्ट ऑफ वायलेंस और डिसरिस्पेक्ट टू द गुरु ग्रंथ साहिब विच इज अ लिविंग गुरु सो अनलाइक अदर रिलीजन्स दैट रिगार्ड अ स्क्रिप्चर एज अ होली लिटरेचर दैट दिस इज द की लिटरेचर फॉर अस टू लुक इन टू द रिलीजन जैसे द बाइबल कुरान और भगवद गीता और द वेदास फॉर द हिंदूज मुस्लिम्स एंड क्रिश्चियंस फॉर द सिक्स द गुरु ग्रंथ साहिब इज अ लिविंग गुरु ही इज लाइक अ पर्सन बट इन इंडिया द सेक्शन रिलेटेड टू ब्लास्फमी और डिसरिस्पेक्ट टू रिलीजियस टेक्स ओनली अट्रैक्ट पनिशमेंट ऑफ अप टू टू ईयर्स सो पीपल इन पंजाब सिक्स हैव बीन डिमांडिंग अ हायर पनिशमेंट फॉर सैक्रिलेज टू द गुरु ग्रंथ साहिब और एनी अदर एस्पेक्ट रिलेटेड टू द सिख रिलीजन जैसे कि कृपान करतार ओके दे आर ऑल्सो एक्ट टूवर्ड्स द प्रेयर ऑफ द गुरु विच इज द गुरु ग्रंथ साहिब सो इफ सम वन लेट से आई गो एंड हिट ए ए इज अ पर्सन आई ट्राई टू मर्डर ए I may get a sentence up to a life imprisonment. Whereas if I go and disrespect the Guru Granth Sahib, I will only be liable for two years of imprisonment. This is the problem that has been highlighted, and the law was amended in 2018 by the Punjab Assembly to provide up to life imprisonment for sacrilege attempts. That law has not yet been approved, which the government is asking for the same. okay then we move on government has recovered 13000 crores from fugitives economic fugitives or people who ran away from india taking away money the government has informed that till now 13000 crores has been recovered this is in total to the this is much less than what we actually need from them but this is what it is then government blink sends two bills for review two bills that is the mediation law and the bill to increase the marriageable age of girls from 18 to 21 have been sent to standing committees for review they will now be so the opposition and members of the opposition who will be part of the standing committee will now be able to discuss and deliberate upon the issues related to these bills in the standing committee then the nagaland assembly has called for a unanimous resolution for repeal of afspa this is a key demand for any peace talks by the nscm im okay so five resolutions five the demands among the five resolutions that were there were appropriate authority for botched up army operation that led to 14 civilian death plus a total repeal of afspa from the state okay we have already done a separate episode on what is afspa please make sure that you if you are someone who is unaware of what afspa is what are the special powers granted to forces under afspa make sure you do check it out then we move on on the right hand side bimstec working on a joint defense disaster relief plan what is bimstec bimstec is a grouping of nations around the bay of bengal bay of bengal has recently become the hub for more and more natural disaster so what should be the ideal response whenever a collective identity a collective storm happens so in that regard the first inaugural index disaster management exercise that is panex was held for the bimstec countries bangladesh initiative for multilateral multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation in 2019 inauguration ceremony an oath taking ceremony of the prime minister all the heads of the states of the bimstec nation were invited okay then we move on on the world news the world news one big one is beijing defends the hong kong polls amid record low turnout 
these were the first nationalistic only elections in Hong Kong that only saw 30% of the people cast their vote. Down from the 60%, almost 60% in the last one, which were seen as a sweep for the pro-democracy people. There had been boycott. Elections were supposed to happen in 2019, but they were cancelled owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. And between that, a lot of water has flown. To discuss all of that, I will be taking a special class on an academy tomorrow at 9 p.m. This class will discuss the entire Hong Kong system. What did China do? What all transpired? What is the history of Hong Kong? Who was brought in? What were these amendments? Who led these protests? What are these groups? Everything related to it. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. You can subscribe to this class and receive a notification by pressing the link in the notification box, in the description box. Then Chile's leftist millennial elected Chile's president. This is a country in Latin America has now choosed a former student leader, Boric, Gabriel Boric, as their youngest ever president, okay? Who has turned... 35 and received 56% of the vote. He is seen as a leftward tilt for the Latin American policies. All right. And he has vowed to take the country towards a more fiscally responsible outlook. So it needs to be seen what will happen. His rise in terms of popularity has been stark. There have been continuous protests in Chile against the rule of the current president. Okay. That is Antonio Cast in total of 56% vote out and he has won the election. Then Abdullah Yameen, who was the former president of Maldives. Now, this month he was out of prison. His charges for which he was in jail was dropped. And he has once again started the protest for India out. He was seen a candidate who was much closer to the Chinese regime. And taking actions for them or in their favor against India. So much so that during his time, GMR, which is an Indian company, was expelled from the airport at Malay. And then more anti-Indian investments decisions were taken by his government to favor the Chinese. Now that he's out, he has been leading India out campaigns, which are seen as a threat by the government and have been called out. Okay, then we move on. The World Economic Forum session for 2022 has been deferred owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, it happened in Singapore in anticipation of the lockdown in Europe. And now it has been suspended or postponed for the time being. Then we move on. Sensex slipped by 2.1% yesterday on rise of FII. Then approval by Competition Commission of India for sale of Air India. This is this will now pave way for the completion of transaction. Nothing to note here. Then on the sporting side, Australia won the second test. India is preparing for it. The test series that begins on 26th. Then we come to the text and context page. In terms of this, as per data, India is now reaching a stage of vaccine complacency in the sense that in the past two months as cases have reduced the overall percentage different districts have regressed over their percentage for example there are still a lot of districts such as Bijapur in Chhattisgarh that has 37 percent Thubal it's 36 percent Kodarna in Bihar has 35% people vaccinated against COVID-19. This is a gap in comparison to a lot of other districts where districts are on line to actually reach the intended target of vaccinization. Remember, we had the set target that we will vaccinate every adult of India by the end of the year. Over November, December, we did not have shortage of doses so much so that Serum Institute actually cut down the production of COVID-19 vaccines by half. And yet the gap is increasing. Then we come to the next, the state of more of a more authoritarian era. 
this is in relation to what has been done by the Chinese government to implement what is known as one nation one system rule the Chinese mainland is governed by the Communist Party of China whereas Hong Kong which is a province of China and until 1997 was a separate part and not even a territory of the Chinese has now been merged with the same kind of system as per the Chinese mainland which is now a push towards one nation one system until 1997 the British were in charge of Hong Kong Hong Kong was a colony of the British and as per that Hong Kong was supposed to have a separate system till 2050 this pledge obviously has been done away by the Chinese and they are now pushing for one nation one system and the 2021 election is a confirmation of that now so we will be discussing this in a special class so please join that special class that is where I will discuss all of this on that note we will conclude the newspaper analysis for the day I want to remind all of you that tomorrow at today at 9 p.m. I'll be hosting this class so please make sure that you attend to it then if you are someone who has no idea of the special classes by an academy then an academy special classes are free of cost classes on their own platform that is the learners app you all can subscribe to these classes and participate in these classes in a audio manner that is unlike a YouTube video you can participate in them regularly you can ask questions you can raise your hand plus you can be notified about these classes on your devices the moment the class is about to begin and the moment class ends you will receive lecture notes if you find these special classes a trouble and want to look for a dedicated batch to prepare for your examination then you should subscribe to an academy's plus subscription take a six month subscription because we are starting some amazing batches for your CLAT preparation and if you want to avail a discount you can use my code KUSHGK for an additional 10% discount how can you do that when you subscribe to our plus courses you achieve and participate in weekly tests plus you now can prepare for your with our experts who are graduates of NLU's so there is a law and order batch that is beginning for CLAT 2024 on 5th January then the DU Dream students who have done BA and are preparing for Delhi University's LLB entrance exam can enroll themselves in the batch beginning on 3rd January students for CLAT 2023 their batch is beginning on 24 December and the emerge batch for CLAT 2022 aspirants which is a six month batch is beginning on December 2022 so on that note thank you so much if you like this video please give it a thumbs up if you want to prepare yourself better do join me on my telegram channel where all the updates for your current affairs will be provided plus if you are new to the channel do subscribe to it on that note thank you so much all of you see you all in the next one